This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. Use the code Linux and save. And welcome to the Linux Action Show Season 25, Episode 3. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Matt's uh, working remote this week because he got a little bit of the bug that's going around. But, you know, that's okay, Matt. We got a big show, so you might as well be nice and warm and comfy while we cover this thing because it's cold here in the garage. Yeah, you, yeah, I can imagine. It's definitely yeah. uh, a little yeah. cool. It's about 46 <laughs> degrees. That's after running heaters for several hours to warm it up before the show. That's okay. We come today because... We sit in the wonderful position of having some of the best things at CES this year run mm -hmm. Linux. So we're going to do our CES 2013 roundup of all the best stuff that we saw on the web from Linux. And maybe, you know, you might have a few suggestions too, which thankfully, if you're in our live chat room over at jblive.tv this Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific, then you can tell us what you saw. Send us a link and things like that. So uh, we're, uh, we got those people riding along with us, and you're always welcome to join us too, Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv. And we've got other times in our show notes, too. But, Matt, yeah. besides the CES coverage this week, we've also got a new segment with a few interesting items in there. And Loving then in that. the feedback segment, we've got an interesting question plus a bonus app pick this week. Ooh. Yes. I decided to move it down there because it's something only for Ubuntu users. And, you know, so it doesn't sure. qualify as a main app pick, but it's still really great. And I bet you might see it uh, branch out to other distributions soon. That would why be nice. Don't, why don't we start with our Runs Linux pick this week? Are you ready? Sounds good. Let's rock and roll. All right. This one comes from Shane, and it's Shane's Raspberry Pi cluster, and it runs Linux. Now, Shane is a longtime viewer of the show. He's been active in the Jupyter Colony forums, active on the subreddit, creator of two different Jupyter Broadcasting mobile apps, one for Android and one for Symbian devices. So this guy has uh, been uh, you know, prolific in our community for years now. So it's so much fun to see one of our own uh, do a really cool project like this. This is his final year project to make a cluster of Raspberry Pi Pi microcomputers to crack. You ready for this? Oh, I'm ready. Encrypted office documents. Ooh. <laughs> On a oh, Raspberry the, the Pi fun cluster. you could have with that, right? I mean, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he's, uh, <laughs> he's working with John the Ripper, which he's now starting to contribute code to to make it uh, more distributable. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says he's got a prototype of it already running and built. And while it's not quite ready for a public release, everything he's made will be part of this. Anything in this project will be open source code. Nice. And then uh, on his blog post, he's included a gallery. You can see he starts with one Raspberry Pi, and then it just grows from there and there and there. I love that. Cool. That's so cool. So I think, let's see here. The final, the fi in the final picture, I see... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten Raspberry Pis. He's got so he's Whoa. got ten pies clustered together. <laughs> that, that's then that's my kind of pie. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, I, I like me some pumpkin, but now I'm gonna go with some raspberry on too. <laughs> I didn't really realize. I mean, of course, it's still a thing. I maybe 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 cracking office documents is like uh, like more like an exercise in just attempting something because. <laughs> I mean, is that really a thing anymore? People still uh, yeah, use that it's software. Like, how, how exciting is that, right? Yeah, I don't know. I, that from, that's, that's from could that be. company that used to be in Redmond. Uh, I think they just operate overseas now. I'm not sure. I can't remember their name. <laughs> that's so funny. Oh, very man. cool. Very cool. Very Shane. cool. So, that, you know, Matt, we had so many runs Linux we could have picked from this week because yeah. of the CES stuff, and so I was very tempted to do a CES runs Linux pick, but oh uh, yeah, uh, come on. A Raspberry Pi cluster that's going to crack awesome off not to share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's using John the Ripper, which is which is awesome. <laughs> all right. Well, before we jump into high gear and really start ripping through all the things we've got for you this week, let's take a pause and say good morning to the fine folks over at GoDaddy.com, longtime sponsors of the Linux Action Show. And, uh, of course, now you remember for my birthday, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, Danica extended a very special offer for the Linux Action Show crowd. If you use the code Linux295 when you check out, that's Linux295 when you check out, you get a .com for $2.95. And That's I like, tell you what, I scored a couple, and I, I it was just such a great deal. You have to, right? I mean, I, you know, i got to figure what's actually happening behind the scenes is Danica is actually breaking into GoDaddy, stealing <laughs> those domain names from the domain name vault, because that's where domain names come from. Of and course. Then, and then just divvying them out to us, because there's no way GoDaddy could actually be selling <laughs> .coms for $2.95. I, there's no way to do that. So you're talking like Mission Impossible <laughs> dropping yeah. in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And she's wearing that white uh, top when she's doing it, and she drops in there, and her hair's all over the place, and she's... That's awesome. 
Anyways, I don't want to get into it. But you can picture it. You can just picture it. And uh, so thank you to GoDaddy. Oh, and also, if you're doing some other shopping over at GoDaddy, maybe you're not getting yourself a .com, we still have that offer, Go20 Off 6, which will save you 20% nice. off, like a renewal, SSL. Go20 Off 6 when you're checking out over at GoDaddy.com. And thank you to GoDaddy for sponsoring Linux Action Show, keeping us going. I mean, they, they all, for years now, years now, and we really appreciate it. They really get us, and they really, really, really do love Linux. They constantly are donating to Linux projects. I just think that's one of the best things about them that really doesn't get covered very much. So that's thank true. you to GoDaddy, and thank you to everyone who visits our links in our show notes, because just visiting those links supports this show. And really a big thank you to everybody who uses those codes, and that really helps us out. So, uh, all right, Matt. All Are right. you ready for my Android pick this week? I'm ready. All right. So this one might not be too much of a surprise for folks out there who followed the news closely this week. Uh, Google made a new release. I, you know, I don't often pick Google's actual apps, but this one's so cool that I wanted to give it a shout out. It's Chrome Beta. It's Chrome Beta for Android. Oh. Now, Chrome's okay. been out for Android 4.0 and yeah. above for a little while now. This, again, is Android 4.0 and above. What's interesting is Chrome Stable is at version, uh, I think, 19 right now, you know, which yeah. is crazy that Chrome's at version 19. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Uh, and I believe the, ver oh, it's version 18 that's in the store, and the beta version is version 25. Oh, wow. So they're way hit. Okay. Pretty big leap. Pretty big leap. So and it, so this is just like on the desktop. There's a beta channel for Chrome. There's now mm -hmm. a beta channel for Android. And it works great on tablets. They've introduced some new features and improved speed across the board. Uh, and what's, what I like about it is you can install it alongside regular Chrome. So you still have Chrome stable. Mm -hmm. And then you can just play in Chrome beta. And because Chrome syncs between all the different Chrome browsers, all your bookmarks mm -hmm. and all your passwords yeah. and all your stuff is available in both the beta and the regular Chrome. So that's pretty nice. That's really sweet. And, and you know, it's interesting how far they've come and how, uh, how far they continue to advance. I mean, the fact that they're just progressing at that. And what I love more than anything about using Chrome, at least on the desktop, I can't speak for the, the mobile stuff, is that uh, my extensions don't break. Oh, just, yeah. Just throwing that out there, Firefox. Yeah, yeah. Just saying. From a from the perspective of a extension publisher, fu mm -hmm. it's funny because I completely agree with you. On the other side, it is much easier for us to publish to Firefox because we've now right. published to Chrome twice, and they've broken it twice on us. Like uh, right now, oh. we have a, we have we we added we added Canada support for Amazon to our extension. Sure, and that. That forced a ton of people to have to reauthorize access to the extension. Oh, and, you know, man. when people get these prompts, they don't, they don't see them or they, they're a little worried, so they don't act on them. So it's been disabled oh, yeah. for a ton of our users because they just changed the way it works, whereas Mozilla is a little more mature. They've sort of stabilized on how it works. But I agree. From an end user perspective, the Chrome method is better. Now, those extensions are not available in the mobile version. Right. Uh, but, Matt, what is really nice, and this is in the stable version and in the beta version, have you ever played with Chrome Tab Sync? I've not, you know, I've I've never really, I've been aware of it, but I've never actually dove directly into it. It's something I've been meaning to play with, though. Yeah, what's well, really nice when you're, we, say, say you're reading something on your desktop. Huh. And you're like, oh, this is really yeah. cool. But I'd so rather... So, like, I could theoretically have tabs open upstairs, take yeah. my uh, notebook downstairs... And basically enjoy that experience on the on the next computer. I could see that yeah. being fun. Or yeah. in my case, like I'm reading something on the computer. I'm like, you know, I'm kind of sick of looking at the computer screen. I mm -hmm. want to go sit on the couch. Right. So I grab the tablet. I open up Chrome. It syncs open my tabs, and I can now just pick up where I was reading oh, on man. the tablet, which is really nice. That's nice. <clears throat> so that's that's currently available in, in the stable version too. <clears throat> but uh, there you go. I just grabbed it recently, and I thought this was neat. And uh, we also linked to a, a write up uh, that H Online did about uh, the new release. The new beta includes performance improvements in JavaScript, 25 that's to 30% better, according to the benchmarks. That's where your speed comes from. All right, Matt, I have a really cool desktop app pick. Really, really nerdy. The last time we did a console app, actually, every time we've done a console app pick, it's been really popular. So I, I got one more console app pick I'm going to do, and then I'll right. probably go to another GUI app, because I know not everybody loves the uh, terminal-only stuff. But this one is so cool, and it really shows you how graphical... A terminal app can be in its own way. It's called Enmon. Enmon. Enmon is a really, really slick resource monitoring program that can do a lot of different things. So here, I'll bring up, if you're watching the video version, you can see mine right here on my screen. So Enmon, mm -hmm. the first thing when you run it, is, and it's just in your repo, so just install Enmon. And uh, when you run it, it says, do you want to monitor your CPU, your memory, oh, your yeah. disks, which I love. I love being able because in Linux, I really love, you know, if something's chugging and it's kind of hard to get an eye on, you're like, your CPU's not too busy. It's probably your disk. And so you exactly. can use this program to check your disk throughput. And at the same time, it can log to a CSV file. 
And what's really nice about the fact that it logs to a CSV file is, like, say you're a server person or something like that, and you want to get a snapshot of how your machine's been performing over a period of time. They also include a cell, an Excel file, which I'm sure probably works in OpenOffice just fine, which takes that CSV data and generates really, really nice-looking graphs and charts and things like that. Oh, that's great. So you could actually have a documentable report yeah. that you can then yeah. share to people that have no idea what you're talking about, but they need to vi- they need the visual sense of what you're describing to them. They're and like, you can get oh, a historical yeah, okay. sense. Like you can say, well, you right. see here, like, yeah, at, at 8 a.m. when everybody gets into the office and they start logging in, the system really gets under some serious load, and our disks just aren't keeping up with the demand. And so there's our problem. Uh, but check nice. this out. All right, so here's Enmon. For this, uh, for this demo, I'm going to say I want to monitor CPU. Okay, so it starts up and there's my it sees my two cores mm-hmm. and it also gives me an average. Now uh, earlier I did this on an eight core system and it's really cool because you get eight bars oh, that's that are so that, sweet. Are, that yeah. are being drawn by characters in real time. So watch now I'll throw a task at my machine here. So I'm going to take the last episode of Unfilter, episode thirty two, mm-hmm. and because I'm a masochist, I want to make a WebM version of that. <laughs> Yeah. So I say create, and now Arista starts going on episode 32 of Unfilter, and now you can see in Enmon, the, uh, it starts drawing CPU meters, and this is all on the terminal. So it's using characters to draw these meters in a terminal window, so this would work over SSH. It's really nice. nice. And you, you can now see I'm really taxing my CPU here, and I have an av- average CPU usage of 90, 73%, 93%, things like that. Right. Now, of course, you can use top. You can use a lot of different programs to do this. The nice thing about Enmon is, A, it's got a really nice graphical look to it. So it's just good for like having up on your screen and like glancing over and like, oh yeah, yeah. That's cool. Okay. I got a real nice visual picture of where things are at. That's nice to have. But it's also great to have that historical stuff. But if you're not an expert, like if you don't know what a load average of five means on your system, and maybe you have a two core processor. A lot of folks may not. Right. And so this is a little bit different way to sort of process that information where you kind of have a better idea. Yeah, this thing's actually taxing the crap out of my machine right now. So it's called Enmon, and it uh, it doesn't monitor just CPU, of course. And so, you know, for you visual folks, watch. When I hit pause here on the uh, encoder, you'll Mm -hmm. see it just, uh, just like you would expect. The CPU usage just drops right down there. So goes. that's a really great way to actually troubleshoot, uh, not only an ar- if you're going to be argumenting for an upgrade to your supervisor, but uh, you know that you need to upgrade some stuff, but also to troubleshoot anything that might be causing problems that you can't quite put your finger on. I like yeah. that. Yeah, and here's a report of how it looks with yeah. memory. And so you, exactly like you're saying, Matt, if you can't quite mm-hmm. put your finger on it, it pulls up this different information. Love I get it. an idea that, well, okay, 52% of my memory is free right now. And just right there, very clear, 52% of my memory is free. So I know exactly where I'm at. I know I'm not using too much memory. So, oh, that's fantastic. Is, that's, a, my, that's a must-have, I it, think. For a system admin or anybody that just kind of want, wants to be able to watch their system from a terminal. And, you know, maybe you're not using SSH. Maybe you just want to have a terminal window up on your desktop while you're working because it doesn't take up a ton of screen real estate. You know, you can, you can scrunch it up and just have it right there in a window as you work. And I'm going about my business, and now I just have a nice handy monitor that's very low impact on my system performance as I work on my computer. So and that's, that's one of the advantages of not having a GUI in a lot of cases is that it's unnecessary overhead removed. Yeah, that's so. very true. It's very true. Yeah. And it works over SSH, which I Exactly. Love. So anyways, that's Enmon for Linux, and uh, we have a link to that in the show notes. But again, you'll probably just find it in your repo. That's where I have found it for every system I've tried to put it on. And uh, see what you can throw at it. it it'll, uh, you can also stack them so you can display the CPU and the disk and the memory at the same time. So you can get a lot of things going at once, or you can just look at just the CPU, look at just the disk. Very cool. This would be awesome on a dual monitor setup. I, I have dual monitors here, and that would be great because you could just pop that over to your, uh, one of your monitors while you're working, and you can just glance over real easily. I mean, what a, what a great find. Yep, yep, yep. So uh, stuff. we actually had that sent in by a few folks, and it's one that I've installed over the years. The other one I like quite a bit, it's in the same category, it's called DSTAT. Mm. And uh, let's see if I have DSTAT installed. DSTAT will, uh, what's a little bit different about DSTAT is it gives you uh, sort of an ongoing report. Here, I'll just install mm. it real quick. It gives you an ongoing report of uh, your li- a lot of your different snapshots across the board. So your disk, your net, your network, your CPU, your wait times on I/O and things like that. So here I'm I'm installing uh, DStat right now. So I'll run DStat. So this is a good companion. And yeah, the DStat here tells me my user load, my system load, my idle load, all the information Top gives me. But in this continuous uh, report that just Constantly scrolls and monitors, and again, it would fit really well in a window up in the corner of your screen. Mm-hmm. DStat's available in just about every repo. And the great thing about DStat is a little bit different than Enmon. It's just it's a, it's a really quick snapshot. So if I, when I log into a system and it's just dog slow and I don't know <laughs> what's going on, I don't load Enmon. I don't load Top. I generally load DStat uh, just to right. get a just, cause, uh, You might be able to tell. The, the overall tone yeah. here is I've been dealing in my client situation 
with major disk I.O. problems. They have a bunch of VMs that run over an NFS mount, mm -hmm. and that NFS mount is just being hammered. And so you can go into the systems and you can see, gosh, you know, I have eight cores here. I've got 16 gigabytes of RAM. What is the holdup? And you'll see, oh, well, my wait, my wait time on my I.O., well, on the computer I'm showing on right now is zero. But on some of these systems, it's 90. It's way, way up there. You know, it's, it's, the computer is spending the majority of its time just waiting on the disk. And programs like Nmon and DSTAT can, can show you that and can really quantify what is causing that slowdown. You know, if you launch a web browser and the window loads and then, like, all of the user UI elements just kind of slowly mm -hmm. pop in and it kind of builds its frame around, that's probably your disk. And using programs like this can tell you that. So. Oh, definitely. Well, and I also think they're really good learning tools. If you're just getting into administration, what a great way to get a granular understanding as to what does what and what, what the cause and effect of this is and what the cause and effect of that is. Yeah. I think that's, they're really good learning tools as and well. They Also, just as a, just as a quick aside, uh, they both have uh, really good uh, man pages. So you can man mm -hmm. DSTAT or man yeah. NMON, and you can read about what these different readouts actually mean and Linux and, and, and yeah. you know, you, in some of them, you can even get insights of how it pulls this information, what files it's looking at to pull this information. You can go get this information yourself. So it's also just good from that standpoint. So oh, definitely. Point. All right, Matt. Well, before we jump into the news, I just want to give a quick mention because we've got some upcoming expenses, so it's good to remind folks that you can support the Jupiter Broadcasting Network and keep our ads to as minimum, to as minimum as possible. And this way, we only work with the folks we want by using our affiliate system over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. You just scroll down to the bottom of our website before you shop at Amazon or eBay or Netflix. Yeah, Netflix. Would you believe? If, yeah, Netflix. Exactly. Uh, Newegg, ThinkGeek, Best Buy, all of those are, are down there. You click there before you shop. Or grab the Chrome or Firefox extension. It has more sites than we have. Like, you know, I think Monoprice is going to be added soon if it hasn't been already. And then when you shop, you don't even have to think about it. it just That's the way I like it. to do it because then it's just a no-brainer. You just go about your daily business. You don't have to consciously think, oh, wait, i got to go here to go do this. It just yep. takes care of it. It supports us. It's, it's fantastic. And they, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago, we updated the Chrome extension. Mm -hmm. And now when you're shopping, there's a little Jupiter Broadcasting icon, so you know you're supporting us. And, oh, that's uh, so cool. Yeah, yeah. We, we really do appreciate it. And that keeps us going, and it keeps us responsible to only really have an answer to you guys, that's which right. is the favorite thing. That's my favorite thing about it. All right, Matt. Well, let's do the news. Hey, what's new in the news? All right, Matt. Our, our first story this week almost made it in the news docket last week. Just that close. That close, huh? So I thought we'd make it our first story this week. Blizzard announces they're planning a game for Linux. Well, I don't know if announces hmm. is the right term here, but uh, you know Blizzard, of course. They're the guys behind World of Warcraft, StarCraft, Diablo. And the word on the street is they're planning for a game announcement in 2013. Interesting. It's, and it's, I guess it's already been a poorly kept secret, according to Phronix, that Blizzard has a native client of World of Warcraft internally. See, I never knew this, uh, but I guess as recently as 2011, the World of Warcraft Linux client was still being maintained by an internal team. The client has been around for years, and it's done so by their own developers as a form of testing. That's... <laughs> You do, you don't know whether to be excited or angry about that, <laughs> right? I know, right? Yeah, I know. It's like, are you keeping the goods? Are you are you keeping the goods on us? Exactly. First? Uh, uh, it goes on. Uh, the Phronix article goes on to say, in May of last year, when a Blizzard representative was asked about Diablo three for Linux, it came down to a matter of ensuring there is a commercially viable Linux gaming market and that the resources can be justified. This is a quote here. I know we actually have a lot of stuff that we dot dot dot, like like our servers that they actually use Linux. So I don't think it would sure. be that outrageous, but I think we'd have to see that there'd be some demand for it, mm -hmm. and then we'd have to see that there'd be demand that the demand would be worth the time it would take away from other things we could do. This was an executive uh, vice right. president of Blizzard, and then in 2012 he later said that they agreed with Valve's uh, Gabe's Gabe from Valve when he said that Windows 8 was catastrophe. Uh, Blizzard called it not great. Windows 8 is not great for Blizzard, is what they say. They're not, they're not going to be quite as absolute as the other guys, yeah. I guess not, yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, now, this is coming from a reliable source. We're uh, talking to uh, Michael at Phronix. He says that at least one of their very popular titles will receive a release for Ubuntu this a calendar year. And uh, Michael says he was told this in person, and it was a statement backed up with some additional proof. With their first Linux port, they will use it to judge the waters of Linux gaming themselves to decide further course of action. This port okay. is being done internally by their own developers, which isn't a huge surprise given past public statements. 
And uh, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised to see World of Warcraft or maybe Diablo, but I would think I'm, it's probably going to be. I'm thinking probably Diablo, but I think World of Warcraft may not be far behind. And here's what's interesting. Last I heard, and correct me, guys, if I'm wrong on this chat room, but I believe that Blizzard actually had a little bit of a stagnation in their profit center. So maybe they're looking to kind of – Oh yeah, I do think I lost them out a little bit, you know, and say, you know what, maybe we need to rethink some stuff. <laughs> now that we now that we need a little more money, maybe yeah, we'll port to Linux. Yeah. Uh, I know that you know World of Warcraft is one of like the premier games that Wine supports because there is demand oh. there, and I would think that Blizzard would be able to detect that. I mean, we've heard of them blocking Diablo three players because they were using Wine, so they know again they're aware of Wine right. usage. Which would seem to indicate at least there's some demand, because if you're willing to go through the trouble of running wine, you probably really want to play it. Well, and I also think it presents an interesting chicken or the egg uh, situation, because they see the, indica- the indicators of wine users thinking, oh, okay, well, clearly there's a demand there, but they're also saying, but then again, there's probably a lot of people dual booting to play World of Warcraft 2 that are going back into Windows to do it, so they're not able to get a real accurate number. And so they're not quite sure that they were ready to go forward with it. But at the same time, I think by having that Linux client in the background kind of constantly stewing, yeah. if or something if something happened like, say, oh, I don't know, uh, a competing company released games for uh, released a, a Steam engine for Linux, for instance, <laughs> then maybe they would have something to then work with. And I think that's kind of how they operated. They figured they would invest minimal effort, have it kind of, I don't know, crock-potting in the background, if you will. And yeah. that way, all they got to do is throw the switch on that bad boy, start, you know, start bringing the games into it and they might be ready to go i think yeah. i think this is interesting i but i i, I wonder how long it's going to take throughout this year like well the, this soon. article says this yeah. year calendar year 2013 right but i mean like how many months you know yeah I mean, like, yeah is that december <laughs> yeah yeah exactly that's kind of yeah. what i'm wondering it's like yeah. you know are they going to wait and see some more <laughs> you know well why not i mean why not from their perspective and i you sure. know i i i the the fact of the matter is is that it already runs on the Mac. So we know that Diablo and World of Warcraft and I think StarCraft 2 is available for the Mac. Those all have uh, OpenGL versions of the game. Right. So we know that those games do OpenGL. They're not just DirectX games. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not saying that's all of the work, but it is yeah. a big portion of the work, I would think. So oh, it's a big, big portion, I would believe, yeah. I, I personally could care less about World of Warcraft. I would like to see Diablo 2 or, or I mean, Diablo right. 3. Or uh, StarCraft 2. That would be the ones. In fact, I don't yeah. even want to see screw Diablo 3. I'm done with Diablo 3. I've I've moved on to indie games for you know I've got Trine and and, and not Trine sure. but uh, what a Torchlight and oh, yeah. uh, Torchlight's great. Torchlight one's available for Linux and I, it's it's a you know it's what Diablo 3 should have been. I though StarCraft 2. I wouldn't mind getting that. I wouldn't mind getting that. That would be cool. I you know I used to be a big and this is long going back even further. I used to be a big fan of the uh, Battlefield games. Uh, you know Battlefield 1942, Battlefield. Two Battlefield, whatever the other ones are, you know all the, you know. So I, I would love to see more uh, popular titles come over, and I think that'd be exciting. That definitely would be. Yeah, I'd be okay with that. And so yeah, wow, not so much. I'm not too into that. Yeah. All right, Matt. The next story comes from a friend of the show. We had him on the show years ago. He's uh, one of the key people at the Samba Project, Jeremy Allison. And uh, Samba Four, as we remember, in mid December just hit its release. Now remember, the big thing about Samba Four was Active Directory emulation. So you could actually oh, yes. set up an Active Directory domain powered by Samba. Now, to accomplish this, the Samba project did something that's, I don't know if it's really been thought about very much. They incorporated a Kerberos mm. server, an LDAP server, and DNS functionality into the Samba project. So now the Samba isn't just a file server. It's also a directory server. It's all these things, a key server, all that stuff. And now Jeremy Allison, in an interview over at Linux.com, he, he kind of said something that sort of struck me, especially coming from him. He said, any change with Samba is still major news in the free software community, especially for system administrators. I mean, I'm a huge Samba guy yeah. uh, who face con- coordinating multiple servers on that front. Although Allison notes, and this is a quote, we're less important than we used to be because essentially Windows is less important. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he probably has some insights there. I don't. I my, my experience is I still work with a number of very specific Windows shops, and so I, I, I think it depends. I, 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 I'm skeptical. Maybe some of the maybe some of the businesses, depending on the geographic location, but I say like East Coast things like that. I think Windows is still a fairly big deal over there. Yeah, and not only that. Yeah. On top of that, uh, Samba has now become like this. Uh, it's in everything. It's in hardware devices. It's mm-hmm. in routers, right? And and it's kind of it's kind of become like the standard file transfer protocol that's right. cross platform. Macs have support for it. Obviously, Windows has support for it. Yeah. Linux has great support for it. And on top of that, 
one thing they've built into the Samba server and the Samba client is if two Samba servers are talking directly to each other, mm -hmm. it's actually more efficient than the Windows system is. And so exactly. it actually makes for it, it actually is able to recognize essentially two Linux boxes talking to each other yeah. and, and can take advantage of that. So it's not like you're sacrificing some native Linux solution to use it. They have built this sucker for Linux. Mm -hmm. And honestly, Samba was truly one of the things that really propelled me into Linux. I mean, it started with needing to build some proxy solutions, but it quickly it moved to needing to build a Samba server. And I, you know, I ran domains from Samba. Mm -hmm. I, I am a, I, I am a huge Samba proponent. And I, you know, some people have argued after I've talked about it on the show. Some people have argued that Samba is enabling Windows, and that by promoting Samba, I'm. Uh, it's kind of behind the scenes promoting Windows. See, I disagree. I think Samba enables and promotes cross-platform cooperation in a seamless environment. Well, and it lets you get Linux that's, in the door, you know, right? Yeah, because exactly. you can move it in. And I mean, that's how I did it. I started with it was an all this place I went into was an all NT4 shop, and these NT4 file servers were just collapsing under the load. Right. And right. we were hitting, we were just hitting performance ceilings and bottlenecks over and over again. So I brought in a Linux box. It was actually a, a Mandriva or Mandrake box back then. And uh, I set up, or it might have been Gentoo actually, I set up Samba on that thing and I moved over the company's file system, file services to this mm -hmm. box and we never ever again hit a performance bottleneck as long as that system was in production. And if, if they hadn't, if Samba hadn't been around, now that company is almost exclusively running Linux across all of their servers. They right. move their entire web platform to Linux, they move their entire login system to Linux, the file services, everything is Linux now. But if it wasn't for that first initial wedge in the door, it never. I don't think it would have ever happened. So, and I think that's, that's still relevant today. And I don't, so I disagree. It's funny to disagree with somebody who's so important with the project, but I just do not think Samba is less important. I think it's, if not, if nothing else, because of the device integration, mm -hmm. it's more important than it's ever been. I would opinion. agree with that. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, I see nothing wrong with uh, with Samba at all. I think it's a very important tool that, as now, it's be went from being a tool to a with all the extra services and goodies bundled into it. It's an enterprise solution more it's out more now than ever. Uh, you know, not not so much labeled for one operating system or one platform or whatever, right. but it's it's just across the board. It's a solution provider. I, I think that, a lot of people bam, still think of it know? as attached to Windows. Like like Samba's success is still attached to Windows, sort of like Wine, like. Wine is constantly having to, you know, mm. w d dodge and duck and, and, oh. and weave whenever Windows does some sort of change, and they have to increase compatibility. They have to, you know, they have to move to make it compatible. And that used to be the case for Samba, and it still is to a degree. In fact, this article kind of goes into more details. But in right. reality, because of the widespread adoption, Samba is almost its own beast now. That just happens to have compatibility with that Windows operating system. That's exactly I, my experience with it. Yeah, no, Wine is, yeah, I'd say Wine has many more challenges than Sambo does on a lot of levels. And and honestly, I'd say Wine even outside of gaming and very select application support outside of gaming, it, it's its relevance is spotty sometimes, I think. I, I've never, I've not been a gigantic fan of it personally. So Yeah, it fills a need, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, because you know, with VMs and stuff, so, I mean, with a with a powerful enough machine, you're just almost better off just a VM, whatever you're trying to do. <laughs> you know, really. Uh, one, two, two last quick points from this article. Yeah. Uh, he mentions that uh, you know that because they are bringing in this LDAP server and the Kerberos and DNS and all, and all this stuff, Samba is becoming huge. But they just found that you know expecting these other projects to implement the the specific things that they need, like when a Kerberos ticket's renewed, it also needs to be marked in the LDAP directory that it's been renewed. And you have right. to have Kerberos ticketing working together with the Samba server, working together with the LDAP server, working together with the DNS server. And it's just not necessarily doable, so they had to roll their own. And one other point that he made, I don't know if you remember, but there was a lawsuit where Microsoft needed to turn over documentation on the Samba protocol. Mm -hmm. So this article asks, you know, has that documentation from Microsoft helped you guys out? Uh, he's, they, Jeremy goes on to say, the documentation didn't solve all of Samba's problems. For instance, there are many cases where the documentation on the file server essentially says, this is from Microsoft, mm -hmm. okay. and we passed it through some Windows magic to make this happen. And then Jeremy says, we, we can't do anything with that. What is that magic exactly? He says, we have to go figure it out and essentially go back to our old methods of testing. Now, there is some stuff that's documented that's been helpful, but it's hit and miss. Oh, There's, Microsoft. Go figure, right? You guys keep me skeptical. What can I tell you? Now this, this <laughs> next, yeah, I know, right? Keeping me skeptical. No <laughs> doubt. Uh, Matt, this next one might hit home. So prepare yourself. Gord, All right. Gird yourself for this one. Prepared. Yep. Yep. Webcam Studios developer says, time to move on. Yep, All good things must come to an end. He says, after much consideration, I will stop development on Webcam Studio for Linux. I don't have time left in my personal life to continue working on this project in its current form. Basically, too much time is required to keep it up to date with new releases of GStreamer, 
Ubuntu, Windows, and so on. My professional life is also time consuming, so in the end, I would need to cut on my sleeping to continue. I worked with Patrick, uh, uh, so I have some insights on this. And basically, there were a lot of factors uh, that uh, went into this, but the biggest is what he stated was there's a G streamer was just a pain in the backside. Um, <laughs> it just, it was just, it, it really was. It was a problem. So, all the back end tools that make the app work kept creating problems. Something we'd get something working, we test it, it's great. A new a new version comes out and that's broken again. And it just, you know, plus you, plus we were trying to move away from Java and get into other things and then make and then cross platform it and it just and it became very uh very just overwhelming. And then of course again he this project allowed him to uh uh get some new clients and get some new work stuff going. So he became busy very quickly. And yeah, actually one of the yeah. benefits of an open source project. Um so yeah it was it, it's too bad. I, I have a I have because I reached out to him a long time ago to revamp this when he started because at one point he dropped it and I reached out and said, "Hey, you know, this is still cool. Let's do something. I'll totally help you out." All right, cool. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, it. Yeah, and you guys actually, you and Brian actually did a re- uh, reviewed it on the show a couple times, and so it, it's it's near and dear to my heart. But yeah, it, it is time to move on because as he points out and he's correct on this in many ways, uh, Google Plus has kind of addressed a lot of the functionality we were trying to do with Webcam Studio and and myself from a bug testing. That is funny. You're the, right. It's a diff, totally different way of doing it. Yeah. I mean, he did the development of it, and I just did the testing and various uh, promotion and things like that. But So, yeah. I mean, yeah, because Google Plus did definitely uh, – it kind of filled a need. It's still got some issues. The plugin is a little spotty, especially if you have Gmail and Google Plus open at the same time. You'll notice that your machine's going to just take a nosedive on you. But, um, <laughs> I know. I but, love that yeah. web apps can now do that. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the, yeah, exactly. It's just crazy. But yeah, it, it, in many ways, Google Plus kind of filled that need. And so I think it was now was the time for him to step back and work on the other things that are a little more near to dear to his heart, you know, then pay the bills, And frankly. like he points out, the code is yeah. open. It's posted up yeah. on Google Code. We have a link to that in the show notes if you guys want to check it out. Uh, you know. Uh, maybe it'll continue on. It really, think, it's 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 sort of familiar if you've got a Mac. Would you kind of equate it to maybe like Cam Twist or something like that? It's kind of like it lets you do effects with your webcam up. It's, it has some cool. Uh, I, I mean, we reviewed it on the show. I guess people can go check it out. But I mean, it's 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 software that l- the Linux desktop does kind of need. I mean, yes, yeah, Google it, it, Hangouts is a, is 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 viable, but it's not not a great replacement. And it's not, and it and Google and Google Plus does, and Google Apps in general doesn't go quite as far as we did. I mean, we even we even right. went so far as to develop tools to where you can integrate external sources into it. You could run stuff from your mobile phone. I mean, just it, the, the functionality that's, that's and extendability sweet. just went beyond. I mean, you know, layering and transitions and all this crazy stuff. Well, it was Studio in a Box. Is what and that's the benefit was. of sitting on top of GStreamer is yeah. you get a ton of plumbing that's done for you when it comes to video effects. You can take advantage of on the system codecs. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to invent that yourself. But, you know, I, I cannot tell you, Matt, how many people in the development world that I've heard from that work with GStreamer who tell me it is just a nightmare. And oh, I don't know what it is about GStreamer. I'm a big G- – from an end user perspective, I think it's great. I oh, remember yeah. when GStreamer was invented, um, right. you know, and I was excited then. And it, Because one of the things Mac OS X does really well – and yes, Chris is actually going to say uh, compliment the Mac here for a second on the <laughs> Linux Action Show. <laughs> what people don't realize is when they think of QuickTime. They think of QuickTime as a media player. They think of it as a video player that plays videos, and it sucks, right? Right. QuickTime right. is actually this whole media foundation pipeline that is, that is it, it's like this inter back end communication systems for applications to pass video and audio in real time between each other. I mean, it, it is it is this system that no other operating system has. Windows has nothing like it. When you when you hear people yeah. say Windows is not as good for multimedia, and you're like, um, excuse me, I see the benchmarks. Windows performs faster, and Windows has uh, you know build your own hardware. You can get a cheaper system that performs better than a Mac. Why is the Mac better? It's because of this QuickTime backend. Yeah. Because this QuickTime backend allows these applications to sit on top and take advantage of it. It, it is really powerful, and that's what GStreamer is attempting to do, is provide this backend plumbing system for codecs and media and transferring mm-hmm. information around that is really important. So I don't mean to dog on GStreamer, but I have seen pro, I have seen project after project shut down, and one of the things they cite is having a hard time working with the GStreamer project. Yeah, and, and, and exa- that's exactly it. I, and I've noticed that too. And it's it, it's not that they don't try. It's just they have a lot of, uh, 
you know, you're, you're reaching across a lot of spectrums, I think, and there's a lot of stuff to kind of pile into one bucket. And there's just a lot of challenges that they face. And Linux audio in itself has has room to grow, <laughs> especially yeah. when you're talking low latency and stuff like that. Yeah. It, it has, yeah. has some room to grow for sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's too bad. But, you know, Webcam Studio was cool, and it definitely ignited a lot of imagination with people and got them producing content. So that's cool. You know, we, we were excited about that. I enjoyed with the uh, support promotion. He enjoyed the development, and it was fantastic. It was, it's all him, you know. It was all, it was his baby. Speaking so. of challenges, one of the new challenges that Canonical was taking on for Ubuntu twelve oh four because it's been you know it's picking up popularity with Valve yeah. and they want to extend it for as long as possible, is they were going to do these hardware enablement releases, sort of like mm. not service packs but point releases for the twelve oh four release, so that if you stayed on long term support, you continue to get enabled for new hardware, like those new Nvidia drivers that add excellent performance and things like that, right? Yeah. So, we've already seen one yeah. update from Canonical. Like and, I, you know, mm. I think this is such a great idea. It lets people stay on the stable, long-term mm -hmm. support. 1204, honestly, in a lot of ways, is a better release than 1210. That's what I'm running on my, or the base, anyways, yeah. when I'm running on my main machine. I yeah. run 1210 on my Bonobo, and I run 1204 mm. on my desktop. And I got to mm. tell you, there's some things I like better. First of all, not having to worry about the Amazon shopping lens. is just yeah. a built-in Benny, but it goes on from there. Well... Uh, the second, I believe it was, yeah, it was the second long-term support release has been delayed. Uh, Ubuntu's hardware backport, which was going to be shipping soon, is, is seeing a slight delay. Uh, Ubuntu 1204.2 LTS is introducing a new kernel as well as a new the new graphics driver components to make this new NVIDIA driver possible and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think it might also include the Compiz uh, full-screen redraw thing that is a, that sort of fixes the performance with Compiz oh, gaming. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, this, this new hardware enablement work is being done since Ubuntu 1204 LTS is being supported for a longer period of time. They're just going to push it back a little bit. And you can find more details. It should be like uh, it should be like uh, like the first or second week of February. It was originally going to ship right. at the end of January. Well, you know, I had a crazy idea with the their whole you know releasing this stuff, and it just occurred to me: wouldn't it be interesting if they offered the same you know the, these service packs as we'll call them that you know for lack of a better term? What if they offered them a, like an early release? It's like, look, if you're a subscriber, we'll we'll release them to you first, and then maybe like a couple months down the road, we'll release them for free to everybody else. Wouldn't that be much more preferable to the Amazon lens and things like that? I mean, it's a way of generating some income, but at the same time, it's not annoying people to death. And if you don't like it, you're not subscribing, so who cares? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just saying, just saying, Ubuntu, just throwing some ideas out there. Just an idea. You guys can just run with it. Just an idea. You can run with it. <laughs> I am so excited about this next story. I really, really hope it pans out. It's super early days. We're just talking, mm. you know, groups are just getting together and laying down the framework. But with Ubuntu Phone OS being uh, announced, one of the key things about that announcement is the native applications will be written with Qt and QML. Yes. Okay? Oh, wow. Yeah. Also, on the new versions of KDE, you can write things in, Q obviously, Qt, but QML. And on the Plasma Active for, like, the Vivaldi tablet and things like that, again, Qt and QML. Well, wouldn't it be great if all of these things could play together? That's not the case right now. But mm -hmm. Plasma Active, Sailfish OS, and Ubuntu phone developers have gotten together to start discussing common APIs across all of the systems. Uh, Jolly, uh, this is really cool. I think it's great to, call, to include Sailfish as well. Um, since they're all going to be using Qt5, why not? Now, initially, the, the set of UI components provided by each, although similar, were incompatible, incompatible with each other. But the developers got on IRC from all the three different platforms, and they decided to discuss the reasons behind each implementation. Now, the end result was there were also discussions underway regarding the aspects of a bigger puzzle, such as common package formats and delivery uh. strategies. This is really good. They say they're poised Very should important. they keep their head straight and their feet moving forward to evolve to the holistic uh, set of standards and APIs that each different platform could use. An open vendor neutral application development strategy built around the commonality of Qt, Quick, and Linux. This is our Rome, which will not be built in a day, but which can become something <laughs> significant in the world if we keep our heads and follow through. Could, could. I, it's, it's, it's an interesting approach. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm skeptical. I know the chat room's waiting for that, but I am going to say that I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence. Well, we got to just see them work together, yeah. right? And there's yeah. there's there's big personalities involved, but uh, you know, it's it's in everybody's best interest here. It's in so I have a, also linked to a post that Aaron Saigo did that talks a lot about this in depth. Nobody gets hurt by this, right? There's no competitive true. reason because it just means more apps for your platform. They should do it. I think it's a cool idea. I like I said I, I 
the adoption is going to be interesting to see how that <laughs> transpires. But I think it's a cool idea, and I think if they can do it and do it effectively, right on, you know. All right, man, I got one more while you got your skeptical pants on. All right. But this one's actually, we're seeing a little rubber hit the road on this one. Not yet, but almost. All right. right. Now, ZTE is reporting to bring Firefox OS to Europe. Huh? Firefox Mm -hmm. OS? Firefox OS to Europe. Okay, (laughs) that sounds cool. All right. The Chinese phone maker ZTE says it'll be working with an unnamed European wireless carrier to bring the smartphone based on Mozilla's Firefox OS to the market this year. The CEO of ZTE's U.S. business revealed that the plan during the interview at CES, so this just happened, Chang also said the company is closely monitoring the mobile phone ecosystem and how it evolves, and says that if Mm. consumer studies support the proposition, it may also launch a Firefox OS phone in the U.S. this year. You know, I, I would love to see it. I think the one thing is I'd love to see it in action so I can really, you know, or at least, you know, actually see like a casual user Drop it in their right. hand, have them interact with it. I would love to see that t- transpire because we've kind of seen it, you know. It seems like it's going to end up on a phone bought by a yeah. consumer who doesn't even know it's running Firefox OS. Right, right. It, it just does certain things that they want it to do. They're happy with it. Yeah, I, I can see that. Sure. Also, I'm not so sure I agree with the concept of waiting for consumer studies to determine if you should move forward on a certain thing because. I think we've seen pretty well play out in the market. Consumers don't always know what they want until you show it to them. And as long as you make a really great product that has value, it usually does well. True. And going by committee doesn't often re- result in that great of a product. I would agree with that. Yeah, I think these things are, are deeply personal and they're very much individual by individual uh, case study. You know. Now, you guys remember the project Firefox OS began uh, actually as boot to Gecko in July of 2011. And then after an appearance at uh, the 2012 Mobile World Congress, in early July of 2012, oh, I'm sorry, in early 2012, they renamed it to Firefox OS. Mm. And, uh, and there, that has gone from there. So now you've got uh, so many different operating systems. <laughs> yeah, and it gets, it's, it's kind of interesting because for you and I as enthusiasts, they're operating system. Or operating systems, plural, rather. And then to the casual end user, their experiences. I know that sounds incredibly markety, PRE talk, and I realize that, but but it's interesting because that whether or not like Firefox or Ubuntu or any of these you know individual uh, experiences really resonate with the individual consumers, it really is going to depend on how that you know what that flows like, what the applications are like, how that kind of transpires. So it's going to be fascinating to see Android, iOS, and Windows Mobile compete alongside these newcomers and how that's going to all transpire. Uh, it's it's kind of exciting. I got it admit. is, and you're probably yeah. right because uh, you, you know these OSs have these newer OSs that are coming up have the advantage of sitting back from the sidelines and seeing what the big guys are doing wrong mm-hmm. and, then right. sort of, and then sort of addressing that now. And so you could actually see, even if they don't have considerable market penetration, like Firefox OS may be right. minimal, but if they do something innovative that consumers really respond to, we're likely going to see some sort of knockoff of that in the other platforms that are more popular. That's right. So there's not necessarily zero point to it because it's you're still putting it out there in the universe, Matt, and you never know. Never it's like, know. It's like throwing a rock in a pond with the ripples and <laughs> Einstein. Hey, they and stuff. could do really well in the long tail. They might surprise us. You never know. Never all know. right, Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. All right, Matt. Now it's time to talk about Linux at CES. I, I actually was a little underwhelmed by CES this year. Kind of found it to be not that enthralling. How did you feel? I, you know, CESs in the past few years have been very hit and miss. And this year, I think, may have been more of a miss than anything. Yeah. Um, I, every- actually, I actually think some of the coolest yeah. stuff was Linux stuff at CES. True. Like, just in general, not even just for this show, but some of the coolest stuff we saw, mm-hmm. Linux powered. I would so, agree. I would agree with that. I, I kind of I feel lucky that we get to talk about the best stuff. Before we do that, though, I want to say holler to the fine folks over at System76.com, sponsoring this segment, and the creators of the best laptop in the universe, the right. Bonobo Extreme, right here. Uh, this thing is a monster! I was doing video encoding on it this morning before the show, testing out that Enmon program. Oh, this thing is so fast. I mean, especially after running it there in my VM, I ran it on this. It's such a great machine. But honestly, System76 sells a bunch, a ton of great stuff like the Lemur Ultra, and uh, they're all, all in one Sable Complete, which uh, we've seen some cool pictures of those. So still check waiting out. to see if we can get that in for review. Yeah, I've been, yeah. I mean, here we are. I've got to check on that again. I may still be out. Check out uh, System76 if you need a system that was born running Ubuntu. I like it. It's all a right, good machine. Matt. Now, Let's run down what I felt uh, 
not a hundred percent new information, but it's it's mm-hmm. always absolutely critical to get it from the horse's mouth, from the source. And this time, it's from Gabe Newell, who said at CES to the Verge in an exclusive interview, he laid out the details on the Steam Box. We've got hard mm-hmm. details that are actually fact, not rumor anymore. And here's what it is. There's a lot of different things out there, like the Piston Box. There's going to be a lot of Steam Boxes. Right. Valve will make sort of like a Nexus type. You know, like this is the this is the cornerstone device, kind of like Google does with their Nexus devices. This is going to be the Valve Steam Box. That will be running Linux. Okay, the mm. official mm. Valve box, the one that everybody's going to buy, will be right. running Linux, right? They will make it available to OEM partners who might want to run Windows or users themselves who want to build their own box and load Windows if you need access to the Windows category. And I think that actually might actually do pretty well because then you're gonna, you could have Blu-ray video and you could also have Netflix streaming and your gaming all in one box. But that, you know, kind of, you know, I think that could be an advantage there. But the idea that Valve has said, yeah, our official box, the 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 box which all else should be based on, which means probably a lot of vendors will go Linux. Uh, this is huge news for Linux in general. This is huge news for gaming. This is huge news for Valve. And we might actually be seeing it this year. I would like to see it. Yeah, I, I I would definitely like to see it this year. And what I would love to see is uh, see it on, as you point out, you know, the potential for maybe more than just one box type, as you point yeah. out, kind of more of an Android approach. That would be exciting. Well, I would what's like cool to see about that. is you can load yeah. it on your own spare box. It sounds yeah, like yeah, it's that's and that's what a great way to uh, come up with new ideas, troubleshoot bugs, things like that. Kind of throw that back out into the community, and and it really resonates with me because I don't see that. Present, presenting any argument for other vendors to maybe take that to a Windows uh, environment in the future, there would be no benefit there. So I think that definitely kind of brings it back home to its uh, Linux roots and keeps it there. And uh, so they had a prototype yeah. boxer they were showing off. And here's something that's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Is Gabe says they kind of look at it, they want a good, better, and best system. So there'll be low cost, which is probably yeah. like the uh, uh, the piston box that we saw coming out from a right. CES. There'll be mid range boxes, and there'll be full fledged, you know, powerhouse boxes. Mm-hmm. They're working on their own awesome controller. Uh-huh. And what's really interesting is here's what he says: uh, we'll cu- it'll come out of the box with our own Steam box, and we'll sell it to consumers by ourselves. That'll mm-hmm. be a Linux box. You'll buy it directly from Valve. It sounds like. Okay. Uh, and they're they're experimenting with. He said biometrics for gameplay. Now I'm interested. Now, what, ding, that, ding, 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 what do you think ca- that means? Do you think that means like your heart rate? Do you think that means like scanning? What does that mean? Do you think? Uh, you know, I don't know if they're kind of trying to one up uh, Microsoft and the Xbox in some. No, facet. I definitely I, think it means that. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. that's what their goal is. And if that's the case, if they're see that's, that's awesome. something new, interesting, <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. You know, just <laughs> it, biometrics and things like that. That's exciting. That's something that's not really done, to my knowledge, anyway. Says, um, yeah, that's that's kind of cool. Yeah, he says, you know, we've struggled to look at way motion input can really be found, and we just right. haven't found a way. He thinks, you know, the implementations that are out there, like Wii Sports, that's kind of the place for that motion kind of input. It doesn't know if it works so well out of there. Right. Uh, he says, I think you'll see controllers coming from us that use a lot of biometric data. So it also, to me, sounds like they might have multiple different types of controllers. Maybe like a reboot on the Nintendo Power Glove. <laughs> <laughs> why know, not have all kinds of accessories, right? right. You know, yeah, why yeah. not? Different game types in Steam. Sure. Sure. I mean, that could be a lot of fun. They might even have a keyboard and mouse. That'd that be kind of weird, cool. but it'd be fun. I want like a like a VR setup to like you know you like a you put a, like a helmet on your head and it's got the whole virtual environment kind of situation. I mean, there's a, I mean the the options are pretty limitless. I mean, they could really th- this could be really exciting. I'm interested. Yeah, he also said uh, he also kind of revealed how the big picture mode started, which then led to this. Mm-hmm. You know, they were talking. They're like, Steam is great. We've got all this plumbing for Steam Cloud and distributing games, but we just have this hole in the living room. Yeah. What if we made this big picture mode? And the way it kind of works in Valve is you kind of got to get, you got to kind of organically get people to your cause, right? So mm-hmm. you had a few key individuals who kind of went around the company for like two years talking about this and trying to get people excited about this, right. trying to get something rolling. It finally built up enough momentum where they're moving with this. Now it's all the way up to the top, obviously, to Gabe, and they're at CES and they're showing it off. I mean, I mean, let's back up here. They're they're demoing prototype units at CES this last week. So that's how close they are. I mean, that's close. That's exciting. Yeah. That's very, very, very cool. And and I th- now that they're doing something truly unique and different with it, now that has me very interested. Mm-hmm. I think that's exciting. And and it's just, you know, a great use for Linux. And it's going to yeah. be great content for the show to cover that kind of stuff. Totally. And, and it's also, I think, going to be really good for indie game developers. And, and oh, yeah. it's if the Steam Box does well, it's good for a lot of those people. It's going to be just become mandatory to target for Linux. That way, you can get the Steam Box. Well, and I think it could also per, uh, break us free of the holy trinity of console gaming. 
uh, you know, we can break away from the Nintendo Xbox PS3 world, you know, and actually really genuinely get a solid fourth option in there. That's I have, cool. I have yeah. a friend who I used to do a show with called Lotso, and uh, they yeah. are both, uh, actually both of them are, are very, very loyal Xbox 360 users. You know, to them, Microsoft isn't the company that makes Windows. Mm-hmm. Microsoft's the company that makes Xbox. In fact, they even call Microsoft Xbox, right? That's to them, it's wow. just all Xbox. And there's people out there. There's millions of people out there. They just right. see it as Xbox. Huh. And they told me, because they, they heard about the Steam box, mm-hmm. and they've been recently trying out Steam on a new laptop, and they told me, you know, I, I think I would ditch the Xbox for a Steam box, because there's times where I want to play on my laptop, there's times where I want to play in my living room, mm-hmm. and the graphics look a little bit better, sometimes a lot better on the console, I mean on the PC versus the console. True. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah. I, I, think, I don't think there's any question to that because I think when it comes to console gaming versus PC gaming, you have more flexibility in PC gaming because if you want to uh, beef up your hardware, you can. With a console, you're pretty much limited to whatever you get is what you get, and you're limited to whatever that company wants to offer you. And so that, that can be a little bit restricting. So by Steam allowing you to bounce from console to desktop to desktop to console <laughs> smoothly and even mid game, you know, like pause your game, yeah, to resume. Yeah. That's, that's, that's very compelling. And as the game title still coming out. Yeah. I'm excited for that. Sure. Mark my words. Mark my words. Mobile is next. <laughs> nice. Mobile for, for Valve is that next. Would be, that would be pretty epic. All right. <clears throat> let's talk. Let's get into Ubuntu phone mode. All right. Canonical actually got a lot of attention at CES. Mm-hmm. They did really well. I saw them coverage by all, uh, coverage from all of the major news sites. Mm-hmm. A lot of the videos coming out of CES were demos of Ubuntu Phone. And on top of that, Canonical received an award. <clears throat> that, was, that was nice to see. I think that was uh, well-deserved. Yeah. Yep, they got the Popular Mechanics Editor's Choice Award for in recognition of outstanding achievement in new product and design innovation for Ubuntu Phone. And there's the team there at, at Canonical. Nice, nice, and, nice, nice. And, uh, you know, basically every video that came out of CES of Ubuntu Phone was a disembodied hand either of the presenter or maybe one lucky exactly. video guy, but almost always the presenter, showing oh. off Ubuntu Phone. Now, one of those right. people that was showing off Ubuntu Phone was Mr. Shuttleworth himself, and uh, he talked a little bit, which I thought was interesting, is he said the night before CES, they had just created a new build of Ubuntu Phone OS that improved performance. Remember last episode, there, were some, right. uh, there was a few comments about maybe a little lag in the phone UI. Oh yeah, and see that, and that, and that was giving bad experiences. But the fact that they addressed it as quickly as they did is yeah. is fascinating. That's yeah, good. isn't that interesting? So it's obviously you know a lot of work is going on here. Uh, uh, they you know essentially every demo sort of um, followed the same basic script. Every now and then we got a few interesting tidbits of information. Like they haven't quite mm-hmm. zeroed in on a way where you're going to quit applications yet. There's a few pieces missing, like, will you get the terminal? That's going to be up to the carriers. A lot, of, a lot of the questions people still have about what Ubuntu OS for the phone is going to be capable of right. sound like it's going to be up to the carrier to decide. And that, I think, is not necessarily a bad thing. I think that perhaps gives, the, uh, gives uh, Ubuntu... Well, it's incentive. It's incentive their to the incentive, carrier. Yeah, and it gives, it gives them a niche, really. I mean, it allows them to truly differentiate themselves in a way that's compelling, not only for the carrier, but for themselves. And then, of course, can, they can then massage that to uh, whatever the end user needs. Maybe yeah. I'm just a huge skeptical mm. pants, but I'm just, I'm just worried the carriers are going to screw us. I'm, now I'm being Mr. Skeptical here, but... Going to screw us? Man, they've been screwing us for <laughs> how many years now? Jeez. <laughs> yeah. You're right about that. You know, oh, let me tell you about getting... Yeah. You know, I, they yeah. won't even buy me dinner before they do that to me. So, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'm just... I'm feeling it. Yeah, you're Not right in a good way. That. But, yeah, I, I think that carriers could potentially uh, take it and um, totally screw it, as you said, and just totally screw it south. But I don't know... You know, I don't know if they could do much more do much more than they already are because at some level they still have to attract people to a new phone, new device, new apps. Right, and don't so you, I, you know, don't you figure guys like us will figure out a way with a Ubuntu phone to to reimage it back to stock or something like that? So yeah, you might yeah, buy it with the uh, crap on there, but it's it won't probably, work with the geeks. Definitely not. No, yeah. they're because they're just going to laugh at it and do whatever they want. And anyway. you know what? If the end users aren't smart enough to figure it out, then that's they, then it's they don't care to. And you know what? That's fine. That's their choice. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Yep. So uh, obviously, Canonical had a great showing. They won the uh, they they won the Popular Mechanics Award, the Editor's Choice, which is yeah. awesome. Uh, they had uh, they had some celebrities stop by their booth. They had a lot of interest. They had a line all the time. I was following some of the feeds from the employees there at the booths, mm-hmm. and they kept tweeting and, and blogging about you know lots of attention. Our feet hurt. We've been standing all day. Yeah, that kind yeah. of stuff. You know, obviously, Good problem to have. Good yeah, problem. yeah. So congrats to them and. 
And now uh, there's the next kind of, I would suspect, the next big wave of Ubuntu phone information we'll get will be at Mobile World Congress, I think, or some, or some big mobile uh, uh, show that's coming up. All right, Matt, this next story, I think, for the Linux crowd, mm-hmm. got the most attention. And it was going to be my runs Linux, but I, I just okay. love that Raspberry Pi cluster. And it's a little controversial, so folks, don't don't jump on the, the, the topic of guns is hot right now, so don't jump yeah. on that. Let's just look at the technology aspect of it. A $17,000 Linux-powered auto-aiming hunting rifle mm-hmm. was shown at CES. This sucker is so cool from a technology standpoint. Right. Now, the price is ridiculous, of but course, this gun yeah. is actually has a little mini Linux computer on it that auto aims the freaking gun and streams the video to your portable device so you can monitor it from like an iPad or I think an Android device in real time. That's right. They were demoing it on iPads, but I think it works on Android too. You assemble this thing, you put it together, you you attach the computer and I mean it's wow. cool. I mean and for those that anyone has a problem with it, just think of it as a water pistol. No big deal. Okay. So you yeah. got your you got your water pistol and you want and you're really looking to soak somebody down. Right. <laughs> this, this you know, I mean this is what a great way to target a water pistol or target anything that has any kind of directional need that would be done with a scope. Uh, maybe, you know, it just it's it's interesting. Uh, maybe you're uh, painting targets like you're using it for uh, uh, there's walls for demolition, walls not for demolition. I mean the the the, the scope of this, no pun intended, could be used outside of just what just outside of its own uh, use in the firearm. I think it's, I think it's interesting. It says here the yeah. uh, the uh, uh, Linux powered tracking point XS1 system is an advanced computerized scope that takes all the guesswork out of shooting animals in the woods. Sport. Of course, hopefully you're shooting at animals. Now, what Bilbo <laughs> points out in the uh, chat room is if you attach this to a robot, you've essentially created a Terminator. Uh, <laughs> although another person here is pointing out that you actually, it looks like it's actually guiding and maybe not, it's not yeah. true auto aim. Right. So, okay. And, and while they call it auto aiming, but it's more like you fire and it helps you get it in the right spot. <laughs> So, yeah, you know. so there's a lot of yeah you could you can go Terminator with it or you could apps you know totally uh, T T five thousand or one thousand whatever it is or you could absolutely use it for wildlife photography. There's a lot of interesting aspects to that. It's 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 cool technology for sure. I really like it. See, and you can see Kit Kat in the chat room is like, wow, I can't believe you guys are talking about guns. Now again, this was just a big story at CES. I don't I'm not trying to make commentary on guns. If you want that, go watch Unfiltered. We keep that out of the Linux action show. Exactly. This is this is about the guidance system itself. Attach it to a camera, call it a day. Yeah. It's fine. If it was running Windows, we wouldn't have talked about it. Exactly. Yeah. You can attach it to whatever you want. It's the guidance factor that could be cool for wildlife photography, for so super soakers, for whatever you want to do. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. You can put on a super soaker. Sure. That'd be uh, fucking great. <laughs> Do you remember one of the, uh, I think one of the first real big Kickstarter projects, it's not the, but one of the big first Kickstarter projects that stands out in my mind is the Pebble Watch. And it runs Linux, and we've actually seen working demos of it at CES. So the Pebble Watch will be shipping this month, Matt. This is a Linux running little watch with a very nice display. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Wired said uh, that the company announced at CES they'll send the first batch of 15,000 watches out to the faithful faithful customers on January 23rd. Then another 70,000 Kickstarted units will ship later. And then sometime after that, Pebble will start taking orders from folks who didn't get on the original Kickstarter campaign. Right. Although they haven't pushed, they haven't actually announced the uh, ship date for that. Hmm. Uh, sure. But anyways, uh, the Pebble watch, they had it there in, in good form with uh, different uh, colors and uh, different styles. And uh, people were really impressed. They had a transparent unit available. I, 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 you know, you go from a gun to a watch. I think this is awesome. Damn, Linux is, runs everything, man. Yeah. I mean, if I could get Linux to actually start like running my household as far as like doing all the household chores I don't want to do, I'm, I'm, I got it made. I want a robot that runs Linux. I mean, like a full on, you know, like a, I don't know, something like off the Jetsons. That, that, that would <laughs> Rosie be, the robot. Ro- yeah, Rosie the robot. Totally. Yeah. Exactly. You Roomba five kind of a thing. Totally. Yeah, man. It's oh like, yeah, hey. she had the little apron, didn't she? Yeah, she had the apron. She could totally like rock me out some bacon and eggs. Oh yeah, and uh, you know you got and 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 then I won't be skeptical and I won't be on the fence anymore. So there you go. All right. So uh, the second thing next to the gun that got the uh, some of the most attention from CES that ran Linux and it's a robot, Matt. The Lego Mindstorm EV3 runs Linux. This is a kit that lets you build robots like nobody's business, and uh, they've been it's been around a little while. This is the newest iteration. It's the new Linux-based Lego Mindstorm. You don't need a computer you can set up basic routines right on the programmable lego brick itself and or the remote control and you can remote control the robot from a smart device uh it's gonna it's gonna go for 350 bones us 
Uh, the best part will be this. The EV3 is an absolute blast to play with right out of the box. We have a little video demo they had of this Linux-powered That's Lego so robot. Cool. So there you go, Matt. You can just build your own robot out of Legos. I could totally do that. <laughs> can't, can it build itself? That, that would be that'd be even cooler. Maybe if you program it well enough, yeah. you could. You, you might have to... Better yet, you get additional Legos, and it builds, it builds an army for you. Whoa, yeah. Matt. Whoa, we yeah. You build Pretty the fun. first one, and then it builds the rest. Yeah. I, like I like it. I like where you're like going it. with that. A little T Terminator. Yeah. And now there, we can't cover all the Linux news, but this one I thought was interesting because it's just it's something we talked about forever on the Linux Action Show, and it's just kind of faded away. And that's the one laptop per child. Yes. Right. Interesting story coming out of CES regarding the one laptop per child. They're working on a new revision to it. And the one laptop per child camp, while at CES, was refusing to show demos, saying it's not ready, we can't show them to you, you can't see it, sorry, although it's coming soon. However, Broadcom, who makes the new chip in mm -hmm. the new oh, one laptop per child revision, said, we got them over at our booth, yeah, because they run our chip, so we have a whole bunch. You want to see them? Yeah, just come over here. <laughs> so uh, The Verge went over there and got some hands-on on the new one laptop per child. You oh. ready for this? It's going to arrive with either a gig or two gigabytes of RAM. And no four, kidding. Yeah, or four or eight gigabytes of storage. It'll be running Fedora 18 with custom software overlay like the old one laptop per child has. Hmm. This designed for kids and fingers. So are they not using the, uh, what was it, the Sugar interface, if I remember correctly? I wonder if they're still just running Sugar UI on top of okay. Fedora, possibly kind of like they did before. Uh, is sugar, I didn't hate, I didn't love it, I didn't hate it. I yeah, just thought it was yeah. fascinating. It was kind of, hmm, okay. I actually, you know, uh, with my two kids, I have found that doing interfaces for children is good if it's the first time they've ever used a device. Yeah, but right. after a while, it's actually, it's worthwhile teaching them how to actually use the systems appropriately because they're smart enough to learn the interface. Actually, kids are almost better at it than adults, right. really. Well, because so, otherwise you end up with a, a, an entire generation of children that are going to the employment office saying, I'm familiar with sugar, and uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, yeah. I can't use Excel or anything practical, yeah. but I yeah. can use sugar, right? Yeah. So yeah, no, I think you do need to graduate them after a certain point, for sure. You've got, uh, you've got a nice hardware upgrade. They've also upgraded the keyboard, which before it was like this rubber tacky kind of keyboard. Uh, right. This is now at, with actual keys that have some travel to them. And uh, it's got the improved Marvel processor, or Broadcom processor, I'm, I'm not sure. And uh, it's got a new sort of, uh, it's the same design, but a little more industrial build to it, they say. So there you go. Interesting. It's, it's, oh, yeah, it's Marvell. Sorry, it wasn't Broadcom. It was Marvell that had it at their booth. I was going to say, yeah, the, the, price, the price differential on those chipsets is night and day. <laughs> For, yeah, yep. so. It's going to be 7.5, and they're considering it more of a laptop a hi, uh, tablet hybrid now. Ooh, uh, powered by interesting. Dual, the Marvell processor will be dual core, and they say it is miles faster. Than huh. I you know it's cool because I want I wanted one when they first came out because it didn't come with like a hand crank and all that I mean who doesn't well, want a hand it, crank it never laptop? actually did but uh, okay. yeah the, the original prototypes did yeah I think <laughs> that's a great idea <laughs> I got it's like a little you know get a little dancing monkey with it I mean that would well be you awesome. know the idea was for someone that maybe didn't have a stable power grid or something like that that's right. why they well, also totally. introduced the Wi-Fi mesh networking too to sort of try to solve that problem it's an interesting idea. Um, I, I would totally be down with one, especially with the new specs. Yeah, I, you know, that, that'd be kind of cool. It'd be cool if they were available to the general public at some level. So I know they did the buy one for yourself, get one to right. a kid, and that was cool. Yeah. But, you know, to even just to have an option just to buy one outright, that'd be neat. Even a little more. Yeah. All right, now this next story is not a Linux story, but I thought in perspective of how well Linux did at CES, it'd be good to look at the other side. At CES, Samsung announces it's canceling its plans for a yeah. Windows RT tablet in the United States. At least this, 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 this iteration. Microsoft That's is not, just yeah. not getting traction with RT. The Samsung, Samsung revealed that it's canceled plans to launch Windows RT devices in the United States. The company previously announced the uh, Vita Tab, the 10.1-inch tab, powered by an ARM processor in Windows RT. However, Samsung is now rolling back on those, saying that it's from the senior vice president of Samsung USA and that runs its PC and tablet division. He said in an interview to CNET on Thursday, the company's retail partners indicated there was no demand for the device. So the executive said it would just be too much time and too much work and too much money for Samsung to have to inform consumers about the benefits of Windows RT. And that's the fact of it is, is you know, they've uh, managed to sustain themselves reasonably well in the enterprise space, although I think that's dwindling. But in the consumer market, they, the, if you just go to a big box store and look at what people are drawn to, no one cares about the Microsoft stuff anymore. It's just not compelling. Right. You know, it's like, Samsung, oh, cool, I get, to, uh, I get to buy a new laptop and an antivirus package all in one. And woohoo. I mean, people are just kind of done with it. So I, mean, thanks, I, I think yeah. this is a yeah, thing that I, I, we're going to see more of this happening. I totally agree. And thanks to Samsung's yeah. incredible year with Android, they're going to become more focused on Android than ever. They're also still keeping Tizen on the back burner. 
I mean, you really need to work on three or four different operating systems. And I think it's fair enough to say that, you know, if it's true, if they were really concerned about the expense of, of informing consumers about the benefits of Windows RT, yep. well, explain to me how Firefox OS or Ubuntu Phone OS is not going to suffer from that same exact problem. Sorry. Maybe that's an excuse. I'm hoping that's just an excuse. I think so. Yeah. I, at the end of the day, when you move away all the curtains and dust everything off, I think that carriers, manufacturers, all these guys want a little more granular control over the operating systems that they're putting on their devices across the board. And I think that Microsoft is not able to to, to deliver that in their current form, regardless of what they're using, Windows, I, yeah. anything. I think part of the big yeah. problem is, is Microsoft labeled it Windows. They should have called it maybe just RT. I don't know. <laughs> or, Windows or, is... It, it doesn't suck as much as last time 2.0. I don't know. I mean... You know, it's like the start. stamp of death now. Putting Windows on there is the stamp of death for, for a huge category of consumers. Not for everybody, not yeah. for all companies, but for a, obviously... Maybe the majority of consumers might even be fair to say. Just anything remotely portable for them has just been painful. It really has. They just not. Yeah. And well, and even on the desktop, it's more. People are buying new computers that happen by legacy to come with Windows, or by legacy they have, have an application to run. By momentum. Windows. But no one's saying, "Oh boy, I can't wait to get me some of that tile action." I mean, no, not unless you're a Windows developer or someone that has tied into Windows in some facet. But Joe Average does not care. They're not impressed. I uh, find it interesting, yeah. too. I think, and maybe I'm getting too philosophical on this, Matt. <laughs> Seems like Microsoft's key problem is, is they're trying to build up. They've, they built up big, and they're trying to, then they're trying to whittle down to portable. Whereas systems yeah. that run on Linux can start at the bare minimum. And it's not just like tiny. They can, they can have a kernel that only includes the stuff they just absolutely need, and then they can build upwards from there. And at, Look at Android, right? Android started bad. Bad OS. And over time, they've <laughs> yeah. built on features and functionality, some of which Windows has had for years. True. But because they're doing a build-up approach, they're building it and scaling it as hardware grows, as hardware becomes more plentiful, and as the market demands those features. They're only building them with the market needs to satisfy mm -hmm. that, that area of product category. Whereas with Microsoft, they're faced with this massive product. They then have to try to, to, try to whittle it down and focus in on it. And it I just don't think it works as well. I don't think that I think that it's the same approach as why agree. I don't think Intel's x86 processors have necessarily been successful as portable, whereas ARM started with this low power performance ratio concept and it's just expanded on that. And now we're starting to see ARM processors that are actually pretty competitive with standard x86 chips. Not there yet, but getting close right. because they're building up. And I, I, I to expand on that because I think you're spot on. I, I, I would expand on that and go even further in saying that I think the way the ca categorically the way Microsoft addresses their stuff and the way other companies address it, like you said with Android, it was start it started out as a project and it was built up from there. Where Microsoft will say we've got we're going to take ten million dollars and drop it into this department and we're going to make the biggest, baddest, most wonderful thing since sliced bread and you're going to all love it. But whereas the other guys kind of I don't know bubble up. A little bit, as you said, you know, they kind yeah. of start out slowly, bubbling yeah. up, bubbling up, bubbling up. And as you pointed out, I, I think that that allows them to adapt in a more of a real time, calm, sane manner that Microsoft isn't able to do. Instead, they just absolutely, they're like a bull in a china closet. They just go gun ho, not having all the details, not having all the information, and they're not able to bring forth a project or a product that really is wowing people. They were successful before because they were pretty much it. That's no longer the case in any facet, in any market. And so, you know, back in the day when they were you know, doing the whole personal computer thing, they were able to do that. But that, those days are gone, and they're not adapting well to this new way of doing things at all. No. They're too big. They need to app, They need to take their company and just completely slice it and dice it and start out like a startup. I think that's probably the only way they're ever going to really see compelling growth anymore. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. So that's just me. There you go. There so it is. C CES seemed like the CES of 2013, while not the CES of years past, was maybe a little bit more of a CES for the indie developer mm -hmm. and the hardware startup. Yep. They had a Kickstarter aisle. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that I think CES is going to go through a transition period, but this transition period is going to be incredibly good for the independent manufacturer, for Linux and things like that. So it's in its awkward growth phase right now, but I think at the end of it, maybe in the next couple of CESs, it'll find its identity again, and we're going to see some really compelling stuff come out. Yeah. Agreed. All right, Matt. Well, that's the Linux Action Show's look at Linux at CES this year.
And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Now, Matt, I thought maybe before we get out of here, mm-hmm. we'd uh, take a moment, put the show on hold just for a second. Yes. And mention the passing of one of the Internet's own. Uh, Aaron Swartz uh, died this week. He committed suicide um, after, you know, what some believe was a, a long battle with depression and also okay. some court cases and things like that. I mean, it's hard to speculate on all that stuff, but... You know, uh, he was responsible for some of the some of the things that make our show possible. Even if you didn't realize this, he's worked on the RSS spec early on. Yeah, and he also uh, had a key role in uh, Creative Commons, both of which obviously affect our show directly. And uh, I, I, my thoughts and uh, and uh, wishes and hopes are with his family and his friends. You know, I've seen some really amazing posts this week from Cory Doctorow and and a lot of others online who've who've really said much more than I ever could. And, you know, it seems like, Matt, some of the most talented people in our community, in the technology community, are also just some of the most tortured. They seem to be, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen that before. It, a lot of times there's just so much going on in their lives, and, we, and we're not aware of it because we're not a right. part of their day, daily routine. And that mind, and, and just yeah. the, it's always going and the way it always works, and sometimes yeah. it can turn in on yourself, and, you know, it's something that I think creative people have to struggle with, and he yeah. surely was one of those. And I think uh, tomorrow on episode 32 of Coda Radio... Uh, Michael and I are going to talk a little bit more in depth about his impact on the development world and, and things like that. So you can tune in if you want to hear a little more about that. But what do you say we answer a few questions before we get out of here? Let's get to some questions. All right. So our first one was submitted to our Linux Action Show subreddit over at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. And it comes from Ninja Jason. And he says, by the way, this is kind of a correction. In fact, I have another correction after this. <laughs> All right. Cool. You can develop Android on Android. Remember, because last week I said, wouldn't it be right. cool? One of the features of Ubuntu phone is you dock it and you can actually write apps for the device on the device. Right. He goes on to say, Chris, I heard you say it like three or four times. I don't know if that's true. How cool it would be when you get a real Linux user land on your phone so that way people can develop right on the system. However, you yeah. yourself reviewed the Android app Terminal IDE, which has all of the tools you need to write and compile Android apps. It also has SSH, so you can do the actual typing on at your computer. Uh, there are other <laughs> IDEs for Android as well, so this exists already. You review those apps yourself. I actually knew that when I said that, and I figured, oh, we'll probably get an email about it, and I'll read it on the show. <laughs> so <I> was, <laughs> We're trolling you guys. We're trolling you. <laughs> <laughs> Just generate a little content there. Um, it's not quite the same, right? I mean, you're, you're not yeah. talking. You're not running the clips. You're yeah. not going to have the full Android emulator. It, it, it's not. I mean, maybe you wouldn't need it on the actual Android device. It's definitely doable, and if you're a hardcore geek, which you probably yeah. are if you're doing that, yeah. it's totally doable. Uh, I was, you know, speaking more like a full-fledged, 100%, everything you get in the development environment, you get right. on the device itself. That's possible with Ubuntu phone when you dock it. It's sure. not possible with Android, and it's not definitely not possible with iOS or Windows Mobile. If it is ever going to be possible with any of the big guys, it's definitely Android. I mean, I just, yeah, I know you could do it. But I meant the overall just complete package experience was probably going to be better on Ubuntu phone. Now, the other correction I want to make... And I, got, and I did this on Coda Radio, too. I'm such an idiot. I felt like such an idiot. So I have, uh, I have the, uh, the Nexus S, right? Mm-hmm. I also have the Galaxy Nexus. Oh, okay. Okay, so I have two different phones. And I, 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 even right now as I'm talking about it, I cannot always keep the name straight. I own them both. Almost impossible, I, yeah. It, well, it, it, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's Nexus S and Galaxy Nexus, okay? And the Ubuntu phone's being shown on the Galaxy Nexus. Right, I have the Nexus S in my hand right now. That's what I had in my hand last week. It was just really meant to be as a prop, just to be like, hey, this is a phone, yeah. and it's nice to hold a phone and be like, it's roughly going to be like this. You know, this is what it would feel like, sort of hold like. Now, really, I, I, I just got, you know, I, I get the names mixed up. I'll be honest. I just, Nexus, that's what it sticks in my mind. It's a Nexus one. I just, I think I actually like, I like the numbering system better, like Nexus 4. Mm-hmm. Much easier. But Galaxy it's it's easier to remember. It's easier to explain yeah. to people. Numbers um, just stick in my yeah. head better. So sorry yeah. about that. If that was confusing last week, you guys, I was just being a dork. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't mean to confuse everybody because I got people go like, "Wait, which phone is it, Chris?" Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> I was just being a goof. Uh, all right, so uh, there's the there's the two corrections for that. Now let's get to a question from M. That's all I provided. M writes in, "I'm having some ARM troubles. Recently, I got a mm-hmm. Raspberry Pi on the SD card. I put Arch Linux ARM edition with Pac-Man." I could customize my Raspberry within hours. This is great. Arch Linux on ARM has Linux kernels for several, but not all ARM-based platforms, and the package base gives you the freedom to customize and update your packages. This leaves me sitting around with other ARM-based platforms. 
which I hmm. bought some time ago, like a Texas Instruments device. They are provided with old Linux kernels and a fixed set of packages. I want to have Arch on these old ARM platforms, but using the provided old Linux kernel with new packages always fails. Compiling right. up-to-date up to date custom Linux kernel requires these patches to use those drivers. Most companies don't provide these kernel patches for their ARM platform. This no doubt happens for an increasing number of smartphones and on other ARM-based platforms using the Linux kernel. Mm -hmm. I'm no license expert, but the Linux GPL license requires these Linux kernel patches and derived work to be provided open source, correct? Yeah, if it touches the GPL code, yeah. then right. yes. If I'm entitled, how would I get to the specific kernel patches from these companies without spending an equal amount of time on re-engineering these kernel patches for myself or the developers mm. at Arch having to do that? Oh could boy. I, should I get the, uh, could, should the FSF play a role in this? So M is, the reason why I wanted to feature this question, mm. Matt, is it dawned on me. These small ARM devices are like uh, building PCs when you and I were, you know, back, back in the 90s and 80s when we yeah. were building computers. Like, this is the next generation of devices that, that I think maybe younger people and people, even older people have an interest, have a curiosity sure. of getting into it. I kind of look at these things as a toy. <laughs> exactly. I don't look right, at them for right. real work, but th that's but the fun. same. But that's the same perspective the guys had at the bank I worked at when I was building Linux servers and they had mainframes. Right. They would laugh like, Isn't at me. that cute? That's, yeah. yeah, that's a toy. You're not actually going to, you're not, you're not putting of our production work on that, are you? You can't right. put that on a toy. And that's how I'm viewing these ARM platforms, when in reality, I think I'm having a little bit of an old stoogie uh, uh, look at it. I, I, yeah. I, I think these things, it's a, it's a good question. And these yeah. platforms are very locked down, and the drivers is a problem. And M, I, here's what I would say to you. Uh, the Linux community needs activists to, to, to right. get these companies to behave. And we just need people that are knocking on their doors, sending emails in their inboxes, calling them, starting groups online to pressure them to keep their source code released and updated because they only have to release their source code for the kernel that they use. So if they use 2625, that's what they have to release. Code I think for. that, yeah, I think that's a good plan. Blog posts, uh, reaching out to anyone that'll listen, yeah. Um, yeah. any type, you know, organizing uh, a group. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know what it is, but uh, you know, as uh, I've also been seeing uh, threads lately, oh crap, I bought a Windows 8 computer. It came with Windows 8 and I can't get Linux to install because right. of the, I mean, this is becoming. These are becoming the, the problems we now have, is, is, is drivers on ARM platforms that are locked down, sources not available, bootloaders that are locked down, and this is going to be mm -hmm. more of a problem as we go mobile. So while we don't have the best answers for these questions, keep them coming, guys, because these are problems that, going forward, the next generation of Linux users and you know, guys like Shane, who is a current generation, uh, are going to be running into. So totally. Em, and we need your help. We need you to go out there. We need you to get these companies to behave and become good open source citizens. If their product benefits from the use of Linux, right. then they should respond by supporting Linux. It, exactly. It's just, that's, you know. That's just part of the deal. And it's there the were some. Of uh, life. Uh, it's the uh, circle of life. Sites in the chat room to actually report GPL, potential uh, alleged GPL uh, violations. Oh, actually, great idea. Yeah. So, yeah, just scroll through that. So, yeah. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So, uh, anyways. Good luck with that, M, and uh, we feel your pain. Yeah, definitely. All right, next question comes from Christopher with Fs. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, uh, are we supposed to like Android just because we love Linux? Uh, am I the only Linux fan who doesn't like Android phones and tablets? Are there Android fans who dislike <laughs> Linux? How aware are of Android? How aware are Android users of Linux? Is this an old conversation that apparently everyone has had already that I just missed? Isn't the important thing that... We all hate Windows. I, I, I mean, I mean, our commitment to software freedom and, and diversity is what it really matters. Right, Anyways, right. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Boy, I'll tell you. Uh, you know, I know people that work for Microsoft that love Android. I know people that, um, myself included, at one time uh, when Android was still fairly early on, and I and I was using iOS as a Linux user. So you know. It, and then, of course, as the apps continue to evolve and certain legacy apps that I wanted, such as Kindle, uh, came to Android, I was right. unable to make that migration. So I think, really, Android is kind of separate from uh, the perceptual Linux platform in that space, that yeah. it's more, yeah. go, going back to my initial statement much, much earlier in the conversation, talking about experiences. I think it's more about the mobile experience that's best for you and what works for you. Android is obviously an experience that fits for you, and it's certainly fitting for me. Um, yeah, I don't think the Linux argument, unless you're uh, 
really looking to compare it really matters so much. From a, I mean, it matters from a visual point of view. It matters to the community, but I don't think it matters to Joe Average so much. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Matt. I actually had the same arc. Um, I, <clears throat> I still have issues with Android. Yeah, yeah, I prefer it out of all of the viable mobile operating systems right now. Right, um, especially compared to iOS. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. But I, um, I'm, I would say I'm not totally thrilled with my Nexus 7's performance these days. Like, uh, let's right. see how it does. I'll hit the power button here on my screen. Let's see how long it takes for the screen to turn on. Right. About three seconds. It should not take three seconds for my screen to light up. Well, that, I have another uh, Android-related issue that you might even have some insights on as well as the chat room. Yeah. I have uh, when an alarm goes off, uh, say, with my clock on my phone, and I hit uh, – maybe I hit snooze, and I'm thinking, ah, no, actually, I've hit snooze. I want to go ahead and just turn that alarm off. Can't – won't work. You can turn the alarm off, but it's still snoozed. You're there's, out a, of there's a lot of things like, like – Yeah, or like little the fact, bugs like that. Yeah. I'm still butthurt about the fact that two weeks ago I installed – I installed software that I, I feel like my performance on my, my device has not been as good, even though I've completely removed that software. Right. There's, there's echoes of the Windows problems that we've already lived right. through in Android. DLL hell. <laughs> yeah, the stuff that really bugs me about Windows, there's some elements in Android, and it to be, to be frank, to be completely honest, it pisses me off that it's happened again. I am mad that they have made these same mistakes again, and I hold that against Android, and I do hold a grudge yeah. for that. However... Yeah. I temper that with the fact that this is the reality of the market, and this is the most viable operating system we have. And there are a lot of things I do like about it, like the inner application sharing I think is brilliant. The sure. way you install uh, apps, like you can do it from yeah. the Google Play Marketplace, and it'll push them. And, yeah, and, you know, yeah, that, that's, that's one really, of my favorite features for yeah. sure. Yeah. There's a lot of things that Android does right, so I don't mean to hate. And it does seem like Project Butter improved the responsiveness issues that I had in the past. I always felt like it was a little leggy. I, right. I, that seems like that's pretty much cleared up now. So I don't think you have to just love it because you are a Linux user, but I think you might be more inclined because Android represents the success of the, of the Linux idea. The fact that right. Linux can scale from all these different devices and that all of these things now in people's pockets are at the core of them running Linux is very compelling. And, I think so. And I also think, I also think that we're seeing a new category, a new class of applications that that really aren't available on any other platform, and there's you know there's so there's the app reason too to use it. Anyways, so I yeah I I think it's I, I definitely it's a great agree question. With that. Yeah, yeah. I, it's an excellent question. I would love to hear I would love to hear our uh, our audience's thoughts on that. You know, yeah. I think I think if I came on the show and I, I and I didn't you know I I completely hated Android. I think I would get crap for that. Uh, I'm just I'm just more yeah. of a pragmatist about it myself. Right. Exactly. What's working for you versus what's working for the the, the gander? <laughs> and to his question, does the does the does the vast majority of Android users know it's running Linux? Probably not. No. But does the vast I, majority know that their router runs Linux? Probably exactly. Not, yeah. You know? I, I would say, th without question, the vast majority does not know because yeah. the vast majority are people like my brother or other members of my family that just they know it's Android. They don't even they don't even know what the hell Linux is. They they this might be people might not believe them believe it when I say this, but they probably don't even know what an operating system is. They just, a lot it's, of people it's, don't. It's a whole holistic device from top to bottom. I, I've heard people say when they want to get an Android phone of, I want to get an Android. Like it's a, like it's a, the, all yeah. the phones are. Or that. a droid, like they call yeah, all of droid. them droids. Yeah, exactly, right. Yeah, yeah that's possible. Exactly. When you, like when you Google something and you're going to bang. <laughs> that kind of yeah. thing, you know. Yeah, I'm going to bang it. Uh, all right, Matt, next email comes from Justin, and he's got an interesting question. He says, I recently got a new laptop, congratulations, Justin, mm -hmm. and I've, I have saved enough to put a 256-gigabyte SSD. He went with the Crucial M4. Nice. And I'm considering inserting a hard drive, or st you know, a standard spinning hard drive, into the CD drive bay. However, mm. this is for long, it's like, you know, it's like a longer-term storage. Sure. But here's his question. Will the, H, will, the, will the spinning hard drive use power if it is not mounted? I think it'd be really convenient to not have to carry around an external drive, but I don't want the secondary hard drive all the time sucking down valuable battery life on my system. Thanks, and nice hair. I think he's talking to you on that one. Yeah, I'm, you know, if memory serves me, I do believe that in Linux, out of the box, that it does still use power. I do yeah. also believe, if I remember correctly, there is a configuration setting in, in one of the config files that you can actually set to allow it to time out after a certain period. That would probably be HD period. Parm. Probably HD yeah, Parm. That's what it is. Yes, yeah. thank you. It's yeah. HD. Yeah, exactly what it is. So, yeah. yeah so, there, there is a way of doing it. Now... If you do it wrong, if I remember correctly, you can kind of bork things a little yeah. bit. So there's you tons of guides, though. It's tons of guides. Yeah, yeah HD Parm actually can can yeah. ruin the firmware of the hard drive if you really screw it up. 
And I would look for guides, and I would look for a common instruction set among yeah. the guides. Don't yeah. just go with the first guide you yeah. find because yeah. it's kind of a big deal if you screw up. So, so out of the out of the box, it will not spin down. Right. By, well, it'll spin down to whatever the default power oh. saving settings are on that system. Exactly. And then it spins up on access. But you're probably safer off to just go into HD Parm, look up the guide, HD Parm, uh, sleep timeout, hard drive settings, something like that, and <laughs> yeah. set it. Just set it, and then when you have, don't have it mounted, you know, it's a great idea. Uh, uh, I have two hard drives in my Bonobo, and uh, right. I, I, you, you, you might somebody might ask, why would you need two hard drives in a laptop? I have my operating system on one drive, and Matt, I know you're a fan of this. Oh yes. I put my home drive on a, on a, on the separate drive. I blow away the system partition. Doesn't matter, right? I blow away. The, I can, and when you're going in there, it's just it's nice to know that I can do anything to this entire hard drive and not screw up my data. Yeah, you totally don't care. And even what's even better is once you reinstall your apps, all your application settings were in your home directory as well. Yeah. So yeah. You don't care. Yeah. You know? Especially if you stick on the same distro. Yup. All right, so Justin, good luck with that, and congratulations on the new laptop. Next email comes from Jeremy, he oh. sa- and he wants to tell us about Remote Admin Bliss. He says, hey, guys, I'm a sysadmin with a lot of servers running NOCD. Hmm. For those of you who don't know, this is a daemon that lets you ex- execute commands on a server remotely when you send a specified sequence of TCP or UDP packets. This is interesting. So it's like, just listen to the network for these network packets, okay? I like that. I have clients that travel a lot, and they need their IPs to be updated on the server firewall, so on their Linux servers, I install the NOC daemon. I decided to take this a step further and provide my clients with NOC keys on their phones oh. so they could carry it with them. I oh, tried the knockers wow. available for Android, but some of them were reli- some of them reliable or some of them didn't work very well. So right. then I decided to port my own Java knocker to Android myself. Check it out and rate and review it if you could. And so um, since this is so specific, I decided not to make an Android app pick, but right. cover it as a feedback item. So anyways, guys, check this out. If you want this, if you want to be able to remotely send commands to a Linux box by a TCP packets or UDP oh. packets, we have a link to his email. He has it in the Android Play Store. It's just called Droid Knocker. He says it's been so helpful for both our staff and our clients. I wanted to share it with fellow admins. And, and wonder one thing that comes to mind is I wonder what that looks like from a security perspective. Uh you know, I mean, what I mean, it sounds cool, but I wonder if there's any concerns that maybe we're overlooking. Well, I would say in order to probably exploit it, you'd probably mm-hmm. have to have somebody monitoring the network okay. to capture the exact sequence. Because ah. it's it's sort of like you know, port knocking is like one of these ideas where you know data is always very specific, right? But if you have yeah. like packet, 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 packet. Yeah, which that happens packet, packet. just with background noise anyway. So right. yeah. So it's that's hard true. to pick it all out, right? But if you have maybe right. a certain sequence that's that's obvious, the system can identify it. I've so you would have to have someone monitoring this. Plus they'd have to know what to look for. Plus they'd have to know what to do with it. Plus the, a bunch of other factors. The main yeah. the main use case I've heard for knock in a in a system admin setup is uh, Mm. You you completely shut off all connections to SSH. SSH will not listen to any incoming connections, and right. then you you basically knock on a port with a certain set of you know a, a pattern. And yeah. then when 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 the system when knock D hears that knock on the door, it then fires up SSH, opens up the remote port, and allows you to remote in. Exactly. And so it's sort of like this extra layer of security, but it's not it's not the solution all into its own. Exactly. Yeah, so. that makes sense. All right, Jeremy. Well, uh, very cool. So, guys, go check out Droid Knocker in the Play Store if you want to play with that. Now, at the top of the show, Matt, I said I had a bonus round uh, pick just for Ubuntu users. Yeah. Although, I, I, I don't know if this I don't know if this could come out for other distros or not. I don't know if it's using the specifically the Ubuntu notification system or what. But it's called Un or yeah Undistract Me. Hmm. And what it does is you install this little just this, this little guy. And then you get a notification when any command on the terminal finishes that took longer than 10 seconds. So nice. if you're, so if you're if you're in the terminal and you're maybe you're installing some packages, right? And so you mm-hmm. app get install and then you go away to to, you know, a different program. Sure. When the Got terminal the returns background. after 10 seconds, you get a little notification your command is complete. So that way, you don't have to sit there and watch the dumb command. You can go about your work and then become undistracted and go back to working in the terminal once oh. it's completed. I used this the other day. I did an app get update, and yeah. there was like 15, 30, whatever it was, things that needed to be updated. You know, a good 15 minutes worth of stuff to pull mm-hmm. down. And uh, it was great, man. I just went about browsing the web. I got on the subreddit, Linux Action. So subreddit, I was commenting in there. And then as I, I had actually, I'd actually completely forgotten because I was just focusing on the right, subreddit, yeah, and, you know, chatting with right. folks. Yeah. And then sure enough, 
up came a little thing. Your terminal command is complete. It was great. It oh, was that's great. That's awesome. I love that. I'm going to have to just check that out. And they have a PPA yeah. available. In fact, that's how you get it right now. It's undistract-me. Right. And uh, we have a link to that in the show notes. You just add that PPA to your Ubuntu system and then install it. Bob's your uncle. Nice. Bob's your uncle. So, yeah. All right, Matt. Well, there you go. That's all the feedback for this week. Folks, if you'd like to get uh, your thoughts on the show, you can email us, linuxactionshow at jupiterbroadcasting.com, or you can hit that contact link that we have at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website, or even better, in fact, the best, it's almost guaranteed we'll see it this way, is if you submit a thread over at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Taking your chances into your own hands with all the other methods. (laughs) Yeah, this is true, believe me. Yeah. (laughs) All right, Matt. Well, what are you up to this week? Where can people find what you're doing? As always, you can find me at datamation.com. Just look for the open source link and you will find me there. Otherwise, you can find me in the show notes. And as always, you can find me at matthartley.com as well. Absolutely. I wanted to give a quick plug before we run. You know, we do a lot of shows, uh, five other shows here at the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. And every now and then, there's there's an episode that comes along where I think, this would be a great point for somebody to jump into the show if they've never watched before, but they've been thinking about it and they weren't sure where to join us. Episode 76 of SciBite, our weekly uh, science podcast with myself and Heather, just released. And what's great about 76 is it was sort of a wrap-up of 2012, where we covered the really big stories in science that happened in 2012. And if you haven't seen some of the other episodes, you kind of get the highlights from the year's shows here. And it's a great point to jump into the series and start watching SciBite now and kind of following things as they go. And and one of the things that's great about SciBite is... Heather puts an enormous amount of work into every episode. Every show has a companion post that might as well be a blog post of information. I mean, it's very, very detailed show notes. With She always has multiple sources for everything she covers, embedded videos, embedded images, and it's just a great show to just sit back and listen and get a little bit educated. You know, kill some time and learn something. Heather's always putting together a great show every single week. It's out Wednesday mornings over at Jupiter Broadcasting, and we're live Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. However... If you haven't heard SciBite for a while, go check out episode 76. Not only was it just a great episode, because we were back after a two-week break, Mm -hmm. but it just covers some of the coolest stuff. I mean, so many cool things. We had the Felix jump. We had the Mars lander, the Higgs boson stuff. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Not only that, she also covered the major science disappointments, like the stuff that, like, was announced and then didn't quite pan out, stuff that kind of had to retract. It's cool to get that insight, Yeah, it was like, I think she called the top retractions of the year, which was really interesting to actually go through and angle look at it. So anyways, episode 76 of SciBite came out last week, and uh, if you haven't checked out SciBite or you haven't checked it out in a while, go take a listen. It It was a great episode. All right, man. Nice. Good well, day. that just about wraps up this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. You can join us live Sundays, 10 a.m. Pacific, over at jblive.tv. We've also got the different times in your area in the show notes. If you just scroll down to the bottom of the show notes, you'll see that we're also live at 1 p.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. UTC over at jblive.tv for the video and jblive.info for the audio stream, which is great if you're mobile or sitting at your desk on a Sunday. Okay. Don't do that, folks. We Don't do, do that. that. Well, we, yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. That's we where do we that. work, yeah. Uh, and also, jblive.info goes all week long with new programming every single day. We have a, a, a little network of podcasts that we work with now, so we always have fresh content. We have a couple of different daily shows that are on the jblive.info radio stream now, so go check out Jupiter Radio. Just go to jblive.info and put it in your favorite um, IceCast, NiceCast slash streamer, and uh, take a listen, folks. we got new stuff in there all the time. And uh, next week... We're getting some booty. We're going to do our booty or bodai review of the Enlightenment desktop. Not, And we'll also be doing meta coverage of the Fedora 18 release. So we'll be yes. rounding up the reviews and things like that. So it should be a big episode next week. So I hope Huge. you join us for that. Huge. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. All right, let's do this thing. All right, let's give me, uh, give me a uh, what's new in the news when you're ready. Okay. Hey, what's new in the news? Uh, I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's coming. No, uh, <laughs> are we doing a show right now? Uh, crap. I would say my closing thoughts on Ubuntu phone are it's all in the carrier's hands. That is absolutely correct. I definitely agree with and that. And all the